him, they took him to the hospital, they got him on uh, life support, um, Roberto was home sick, uh, Roberto
is waiting for you in me. And you love everything that you make. I'm going to join with heaven and earth to sing together. with the praise of your people, Lord. You said when two or three are gathered, there you are also, Lord, to praise your holy name. To praise your holy name, Lord. To praise your holy name. You alone are worthy, 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 Lord.
Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence here tonight, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. You never forsake us, Lord. We can depend on you, Lord. In any situation, in any circumstance, Lord, we know that you are more than sufficient to meet every need, to fulfill every desire. 
to satisfy every hunger. We bless you tonight, Lord, for your faithfulness. We bless you tonight, Lord, for all that you're doing, the seen and the unseen, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your promises that have made us partakers of your divine nature, the gift of God from the gift from God. We bless you tonight and thank you, Lord. I ask you just to speak to our hearts tonight. Reveal yourself more clearly to us, Lord, that we might be a greater revelation to those that we come into contact with. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Praise God. God bless you again. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, worship team. Abbreviated, praise the Lord, but amen. Nothing lacking. It was all good. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, uh, for those of you that are here tonight, you'll have a jump start on Sunday, praise the Lord, because I've got more here than I can deal with in one night. And uh, But you'll have kind of a uh, preemptive strike, amen, on what uh, I think the Holy Spirit's speaking to us about. And uh, we'll get into it even more. Sunday. That's not to say that uh, I'm taking anything away from tonight, other than just that there, for the sake of time, we don't we don't have time to do two and a half hours worth of this. Praise the Lord. So we're we're going to just do what we do. Praise God. And I want to talk to you about uh, incarnation. Now we've talked about it in a lot of different ways. We've been talking about manifestation, about the glory of God, about uh, Him revealing Himself uh, in us and through us. And just we're just calling it incarnation because that's what it is, and uh, so that's what I want to talk to you about over the next couple of services. And uh, we'll start tonight. Let's go to First uh, John, chapter two, and verse six. We'll just read a couple of scriptures tonight to get started here, and we'll move through this so that you all can uh, get home at a reasonable time. Praise the Lord, and still hear what I feel like the Lord wants to say to us tonight. Praise God. So 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6 is where we're going to begin. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Now let's look at this. He that saith he abideth in him. Now that's us, right? Because... He abides in us, we abide in him. You abide in the branch, you know, the, in the vine, I should say, and you bring forth much fruit uh, and so forth. And that's, so that's what he's talking about. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? Praise the Lord. All right, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Praise the name of the Lord. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Praise the Lord. So it's not our righteousness that we're after because we know our righteousness is filthy rags, right? Uh, it's his righteousness that we need to be concerned with, and that is the gift of righteousness that comes through the gift of grace as a result of the finished work of the cross. Praise the Lord. So as I said, we're talking about incarnation here. And when we read that scripture, like in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, you know, we think, that, well, there's not a chance of making our humanness like that of Jesus. I mean, he was God, but he didn't live life as God. He lived as us, like us, as a human being, praise the Lord. And so look at, let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now normally we start reading a verse or two before that where we talk about him uh, not counting it as robbery to see himself 
equal with God and telling us to have the same mind. But here we're focusing on the, the, the humanity of Christ. And that's what I want you to really be thinking about. Because he did not live as God on this earth. Now, I don't know how, if you ever think about these things, I know maybe it's just my feeble way of thinking, but when I think about how am I going to be like Jesus, I know one thing for sure, if I look at this as a deity, as God, then I'm three strikes behind already just going in. But he tells us that we are uh, equal with God in our relationship because of our relationship with Jesus. He's made us an heir and a joint heir. But this all still, we're still here on this planet, folks, and we're still in flesh, right? And that's what Jesus, that's the way Jesus revealed God and glorified God was by, through his flesh, not through his deity. Amen? So just think about this now. And I don't, I hope you don't freak out and think I'm blaspheming. I, I you know, on Sunday, last Sunday I was talking about some things. I get kind of carried away sometimes and start talking about carrying out six packs of Coors Light and whatever else. And I see the expressions on some people's face, and I know it, it's awkward for them. And, uh, but I don't really care anymore because you just either deal with it or get over it or get on with it, you know, one of the two. But I'm saying this is the, you know, we've got to overcome these religious kind of mental blocks that keep us uh, from really seeing the truth uh, in the scriptures. Jesus was born. Yes, he was born of a virgin, but he was still born. It was still messy. It was still just like any birth is. Amen. He had to have his diapers changed or his swaddling clothes. He crapped them. He peed them. You know, uh, there were probably days when he got sick and threw up uh, when he, as he was growing up. You know, uh, his voice changed as he got into puberty. And, you know, it was awkward. He probably fell down and skinned his knees playing and and, uh, you know, hit his thumb with a hammer when he was building things, you know, when he was learning to be this carpenter. And uh, he got cold. And probably when he was little snuggled up next to his mom or his sisters, brothers, whatever, to try to get warm. He had just a human being, you know. He was living like a human being. Amen. And uh, he got hungry. His stomach growled, you know. He got thirsty. His mouth was dry and, and parched. And he was sad at times, and, and uh, he, he, he had to go to the bathroom. He had to go and wipe his rear end. He had to do all the stuff that we don't ever think about, but he did. He probably ate hummus, and anybody who's ever had hummus, you know, with pita chips, and he probably got gas, and, you know, I mean, he probably had the same. He probably belched. He probably got heartburn. I mean, come on. He was a, he was a human. He suffered all of the same stuff went through everything, all of the awkwardness, all of the uncomfortableness. He, he got sad. He got angry. We know this because we, it's all in the scriptures. Amen. He was frustrated with the, the disciples' inability to understand or to comprehend what it was he was trying to show them and what he was trying to actually accomplish. Amen. He was fearful. We know he was. If this is possible, let this thing pass. I don't, you know, I, I know it's not going to be fun. This is going to be horrible. And and so he, he understands fear. He laughed. He cried. The Bible says he wept. Amen. He, he fought temp the same temptations that we fight. He fought every temptation of every kind, the Scripture says. He dealt with all of the awkwardness of not living like God on this earth. Exactly. Praise the Lord. So what I'm saying to you tonight, what, the point I'm trying to make here and what I think the Scripture is trying to get across to us is relax. Put away the goofy attempts to be made more godly or to be more godly and reconsider really being human or being really human. Because what Christianity does is it takes that Scripture out of Philippians and tells us basically, or actually in 1 John, it tell, he, he's, we, we take that religiously and say, now, you be perfect like Jesus was perfect. We're not talking about God here. We're talking about the human, the humanity of Christ. And we're 
the church is pointing us to this perfect God when Jesus is trying to reveal God through a human being, through a flawed, yes. awkward, yes. discomforted yes. human, yes. limited. So what I'm saying is, instead of us running around trying to put on airs and act as though we're some kind of pious, you know, perfect thing, relax and enjoy your humanity. That's what God gave it to us for. It's, it, this is about being a, a real human being. Praise God. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. It's time that we really understood being really human. Instead of trying to pretend that this flesh is divine. Praise God. Now in us we are perfect. Our spirit is made perfect. Just as the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus. But he still submitted himself to the flesh. And lived all of the junk that we live in, in the flesh. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That he's talking about is religious people. People that, listen, they were professing faith. Just think about people in the church today. They were defending God, defending their religion, Arguing against the heathen and the pagans and those who didn't agree with their religion. They were living religiously. And he says, they, that's a form of godliness, but they deny the power from such, turn away from them. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Matthew 23 and verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe unto you, extremely religious, hypocrites. For you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. So godliness isn't about us trying to hide our humanness and appear more like God. Praise the Lord. The more you try to act like God and deny your humanness, the more phony you look. The more hypocritical you seem to other people. And neither God or the world is buying it. They've, they know enough about humanity to know you're still human. And it doesn't work anyhow. Trying to be godly is like my dog Nelson trying to be Einstein. It don't work. He's a, he isn't even smart for a dog. Praise the Lord. All right, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. We're talking incarnation here, right? Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, now this is talking of John, when John saw these religious people coming to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Praise the Lord. These people, they put the focus of their lives on outward cleansing. We've already read that. It's, it's over and over in the scripture. It talks about it all the time. Always this outward cleansing. Waiting for the Messiah to come back because they were getting clean enough for him to come back, just like a lot of self-righteous Christians do. He's coming back when we make ourselves spotless and without wrinkles, and that's when he's going to show up, as if we were the ones doing it, like we could ever make this flesh acceptable. Look, look at verse 8, the very next verse here. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Or bring, in other words, bring forth fruit that shows you've changed your mind. Now, stop, he's saying here, stop worrying about your outward spiritual appearance. Stop trying to micromanage your religious scorecard 
Amen. Stop trying to manage your sins. The bottom line is Jesus' payment made you holy. Jesus' payment made you righteous. His payment made you sanctified. Perfected is what the scripture says. He did it. He did it all. So for us to do the, put on, I'm not saying don't be a good person. I'm just saying to put on these religious airs is hypocritical, it's phony. Praise, Praise. Praise God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And the reason I say that is because when I say things like I said Sunday, and I'm not promoting anybody to do, you know, be immoral or do whatever they think is wrong. Don't do it. If, it's offended, if you're offended by it, don't do it. But when I'm saying what I, honest to God, believe is what the Scripture is saying, I know when people are still self-righteous. Because they're judging me. They're saying, oh, God, how can you say that? How can you or they just roll their eyes and turn their head or perump and whatever. Praise the Lord. Now, it's not about me, so I don't really care. I've made my peace, but I'm just saying... I know that we haven't gotten the understanding of what has really happened here and what this incarnation is really all about. Amen? The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He called you to this place of righteousness, holiness, sanctification, and he's the one that makes you holy, makes you righteous, and sanctifies you. Your fruit is from God, not from you. If you abide in the vine, you will bear much fruit. Why? Because the vine produces the fruit. It just hangs off of your limbs. It's just visible, amen, on you. So just, you know, how about just abide? In the vine, praise the Lord. So here's what I'm saying. Keep your sense of humor. Keep your sense of humor about your humanness. Focus on the good. Focus on the fun that all of the kingdom has provided. I mean, it's almost like, you know, you talk about fun, people get all nervous. Like, oh, my God, well, you know, after all, we are Christians. That you're missing the whole point here. To live in incarnational life. Amen. We were crucified. We have been incarnated. We have been resurrected. We are Christ incarnate. We are to be a manifestation of Jesus the same way he was God incarnate. We are. That's the whole premise, you know, of Christ in you, the hope of glory, is the whole idea of us being the body, but we're still flesh. Praise the Lord. In order, to, you know, to live this incarnational life, you've got to settle the issue that your identity is in Christ, not in your flesh. Jesus didn't think it was robbery to count himself equal with God because he saw his identity as God in the flesh. Even though he had all the same flesh functions and issues and discomforts and awkwardness as every other human being had. He enjoyed the body while he was in it. I mean, he, would, he ate, he drank, he, he enjoyed his life. He's in a party all the time. Everywhere you look, he's going to another dinner party. He's going to another, you know, wedding, a bar mitzvah. Something's going on all the time. Praise the Lord. You are his. Look at Psalms 139, verses 14, verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. We ought to just start right there. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. He's talking about our body, our flesh. That'd be a good place to start. Praise the Lord. Amen. So don't hide your humanness. You are a human. But you are an incarnation of God in the flesh. To deny your humanness is, is idiocy. It's to deny this. It's to deny how God sees you, humanly speaking. We need to become not more God. We're all the God we're ever going to be. We are fullness of the Godhead. Christ in us, the hope of glory. What we need to become is more human like Jesus. You can't, you're not going to change your godliness. You're not going to change your perfected position in Christ. The only thing you've got to work with is your humanity. And we're spending all of our time pretending this is God when God's in here. And this, we're not doing anything with. We're trying to deny it. We're faking it. We're, we're trying to be hypocritical and doing what those, oh, you know, it's, uh, I'm so righteous and I'm cleansed and I'm cleansing myself and I'm getting right. And Jesus did nothing but laugh at that and rebuke it. Jesus makes more wine for a wedding party that's already tipsy. I mean, they're already, whoa. And then he makes more wine for them. It, it's confusing to religious people. They have to distort that to make it fit their whitewashed uh, attitude and behavior. This is a human. It's God, but he's operating as a human being. And he says, hey, they're having fun. Let's make it last a little longer. Let's have a little more fun. I don't want to embarrass these people. They run out of wine. Let's have some good wine. Let's, let's, let's do the really good wine at the end of this thing and wrap this baby up after who knows how many days. Weddings went on for like six or seven days. So it's not a surprise that they ran out of wine. They didn't run out of grape juice. They ran out of wine. Now, after about seven days of wine, you got some people there that are going to be, I mean, there, I'm sure there were a few that said, I'm sorry, three is my limit, I never have more. But there were a lot of them there that didn't have a limit. Their limit was when they couldn't raise their arm any longer or pull their head up off the table. But he didn't, he didn't hesitate to make more wine. Gallons and gallons of good wine. Praise the Lord. He sits down and enjoys laughter and a meal with a corrupt tax collector named Levi. Didn't bother him that the religious people were freaking out about it. He, he had a good time. He sat down, enjoyed the meal and the conversation and the time with this sinner, which everybody else thought was, you know, the, the worst thing in the world. Amen? He rebukes his disciples for not letting these kids be kids. They took away from the decorum, I'm sure. I mean, they distracted from the religious setting that the disciples had in mind. And he doesn't rebuke the kids or send them downstairs to the Sunday school room or off in the bus someplace. He rebukes the people that are correcting the kids for being unruly, for being kids. You show me that in, a, in churches, you know. He's perfectly holy. I could go on and on and on. And all you've got to do is be honest about what the scriptures say, and you can do the same thing. But Jesus is perfectly holy. But he never let his moral superiority keep people at a distance. He operated as a human, even though he was divine. He didn't let his godliness keep people away from him or cause people to be uncomfortable around him or to want to distance themselves from him. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what the religious people did. 
They were acting as though they were already divine somehow without even understanding divinity. And I know it's the white candy we eat at Christmas, but it's more than that. It's God. And God isn't uncomfortable in humanity, being human. He never sinned, but he was a friend of sinners. Now think about this. If you were going to do uh, Mr. Potato Head Jesus, the idea would be to start with really big eyes, the really big ears, and then the last thing you'd want to put on him would be a mouth, and you'd want to make that small. Okay, so nobody knows Mr. Potato Head? Or maybe you just don't know Mr. Potato Head Jesus. But I'm saying, you know, there's all the little diff different ears and eyes and all that. So I'm saying if, it was good, if you're going to make a P Mr. Potato Head Jesus, you'd want the one with the really big ears, the really big eyes, and a small mouth. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. Then Jesus beholding him, this is the rich young ruler, who said, what, do, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus tells him what he would have to do if he was going to be saved. You've got to keep all the laws, you've got to keep all the commandments, you've got to do all this stuff. And then he says, yeah, I've done all that. And then Jesus, look at this. Again, the Mr. Potato Head, big eyes, big ears, small mouth. Then Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, that was before the cross. After the cross, there's no cross for us to take up. We've already been crucified with Christ. We've already been born again. Amen? But here's what I'm talking about. Here he has eyes. He beholds this man. He loves this guy. He hears what he's saying. He hears his religious argument. Right? And he doesn't condemn him. The guy goes away sad. But Jesus never condemned him. He loved the guy. He's just saying... If this is your criteria for salvation, you've set the mark at a place you can't attain. You just can't reach it. You're not going to be able to do it. But he doesn't condemn the guy. He doesn't ridicule him or mock him. He beholds him. He loves him. He hears, what, he hears the cry of this guy. I, I'm trying to do everything. He doesn't say, you hypocrite, you haven't done it all. You haven't done this. You haven't done He doesn't do that at all. He looks at the guy. He has compassion for him. He loves him. He hears what the guy's saying. And he doesn't condemn him. See, our job description, and tonight is a good night for this, has nothing to do with starting churches or growing churches even. God adds to the church daily such as should be saved. That's God's business. And this may shock you, but our job description isn't even converting friends or trying to change the political status quo. I mean, we want to do something about it, but that's not our agenda. That isn't really our job description. God does the saving. God puts people in positions of authority and power. Amen. God builds the church. Jesus modeled a life, and he wants us to live that life. That's incarnation. That's the incarnational reality that we're missing. Because his hope for humanity is that you and I are going to learn to be truly human. We're jumping a phase here. 
We are in this world. We're not of this world, but we are in this world. We are humans, and he wants us to learn to be a Jesus human. Not a Jesus God. That's already accomplished. That'll be, that'll, that's a done deal. He wants us to be real humans. I mean a Jesus human. Praise the Lord. He wants us to be saints who reveal God's glory. We reveal God to anybody who happens to be watching or searching. Praise the Lord. If Jesus came to be a revelation of God, he wasn't trying to be holy, righteous. He wasn't trying to be sanctimonious and religious. He, he, he was at odds with all of that all of his life. He came to be a complete, a real human. A human that could reveal God. God's love, God's compassion, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's grace. God's love for this world that he created. If you look, look at all the celebrations that he gives the Jew. Why? Because he says, eat the fat, drink the wine, enjoy this life. You only get it once. What's to come is better. But you got this now. Live it as a human being. Instead of sitting there clicking your tongue at somebody else for having a drink or for going to a movie or for you know listening to a certain kind of music or or whatever it is they're doing that you don't feel is religious enough or because they're not quoting scripture every time they're in the company of other people we have turned more people off and away from God by our religious attitudes than than we could imagine ever having reached for God by just being a good human being. A real human being with God in us. People are attracted to kind, generous, forgiving, merciful people. Why? Because it's a God attribute. It's the love of God being manifested. And you don't have to do anything. They can just watch you and go, there's just something about John. You know, he's not thumping the Bible. He's not beating me over the head with my bad behavior. He just looks happy. He looks content. He seems to be enjoying this life that all of us are wringing our hands about. And I mean, my God, we've got the church freaking out over who's the president. You know, I mean, who's our senator? I'm not saying I don't get aggravated with politicians, but after all, they're politicians. It's like being shocked that a sinner goes out and does drugs. Come on, they're sinners. They're politicians. It's the old saying, if their lips are moving, they're lying. Is that, should that come as a shock to us? Do, do we have to lay awake nights worrying and fretting over that? No. We're supposed to be at peace. We're supposed to be unconcerned in terms of the outcome of situations because God holds our outcome. He has our life. Amen. He determines, amen, the days of our life. I don't mean the number of days. I mean the way our days are, are lived out. But if we fight against it with this, you know, I mean the scripture even says, hey, if you think it's sin to do it, well, it's sin. You're condemning yourself. Well, you condemn yourself. Now you want to condemn everybody else because you're miserable. You can't enjoy life. You don't want them doing it. So it becomes a doctrine. It becomes a creed. It becomes a religious attitude. And so if you want to be on my religious team, then you got to do this stuff this way. Or you can't be part of it. And God is saying, look, I've given you life. I want you to have it abundantly. I want you to enjoy it to the fullest. Now, I'm not talking about debauchery. And, you know, but I'm saying, I mean, what, what we call sin, the, the sin is the excess. Where it becomes detrimental to other people, where you're hurting other people, where you're, you know, d being dysfunctional and, and vicious and mean and hurtful. 
humans are humans. Yes. If, if he wanted us to be, uh, you know, aesthetic in the sense that we just go off somewhere and eat rice and bread and water, then he would have made that what we subsist on. He wouldn't have given us the appetites for other things. And then he wouldn't tease us with the eat the fat, drink the wine. I mean, to read these things, you've got to see somehow this is schizophrenic. No, this is the God of the Old Testament showing up in flesh. Now, he said eat the fat and drink the wine. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to eat some fat and drink some wine. Because now he's in the flesh. And he's going to, he's going to enjoy as well as pay the price for being a human. He's going to die. He chose the time to die, but he's going to have to die like all human beings die. And he's going to fall and skin his knees and he's going to hit his hammer, thumb with a hammer. He's going to have some sadness. He's going to have loved ones die and pass away. He's going to have heartache and he's going to have sadness and joy and he's going to have all the things that a human being has. He's going to live like a human, but he's going to represent God. He's going to be a revelation of God. But he's going to be every bit human while he's doing it. You know, I mean, I get a phone call from somebody and they're wanting prayer. I'm not going to say, you know, I couldn't take the phone call because I was in the bathroom. You know, we don't want, it's like, oh, they don't know you go to the bathroom? Oh, I just didn't want to make a big deal out of it, you know. Come on. Jesus had to go away. I don't think he just went away to pray all the time. Sometimes he went away to find a bush to get behind because he had to go to the bathroom like everybody else did. He was a human. Think about those disciples. And we wonder why they thought he, we thought he was the one, but you know, he's dead. And I bet they thought sometimes, whoa. He don't smell real good this morning. He could use a shower. You know, he could use a bath. He was God. Not, he was a human being. So why are we trying to deny our humanity when that is the vehicle by which we are to represent or reveal God? The more real we are as humans, the greater the greater uh, interaction we have with other real human beings. When we try to put ourselves up as though we're like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we immediately put up barriers. We have already put up uh, a, 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 a bar, a wall, amen, that's going to divide us from the very people we're trying to reach. So, yeah, you've got people then that, say, that see you as being real. And the, because of the religious connotations that they've been dealing with all their life, they go, well, they can't be really Christians, can they? Yeah. But the thing has gotten so twisted and so uh, absurd that that's why people were attracted to Jesus. They weren't attracted to his religiousness. They were attracted to his goodness. His humanness, his humanity. Praise the Lord. John 17, uh, verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now that's amazing to me. That's awesome. God gave us his reflection. And it's not our self-righteousness. It's not our religiosity. Amen? It's his nature. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18.
the religious people said this about the disciples, who, by the way, were miracles were happening. Not because of how religious they were, but because of their humanity. And the religious people said this about them. They're ignorant and unlearned. Ignorant and unlearned about what? About religion. They wouldn't follow the religious kind of routines. They were just being fishermen who had God. You understand what I'm saying? They were just being carpenters that had God. They were just being themselves with God. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It doesn't say anything about what we're doing to make this transition. With open face, amen, just, in other words, just human, just open, just natural. With open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Not by us, not by us trying to be more religious, not by us trying to be more divine, but by us being human, filled with God's presence, with God's Spirit. Amen? Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here's what I'm saying in essence, just to wrap up tonight. We matter. We matter in God's incarnational kingdom. His kingdom has come. I'll get into this more Sunday, but I wanted to just shock somebody tonight so I have somebody on my side Sunday. Praise the Lord, hopefully. So we matter in God's incarnate kingdom. Praise God. We enjoy him. We reflect him. We bring glory to him. And we become more like him all the time. How? By being human. Not by being some ethereal, vaporous, you know, ghost-like, uh, you know. No, by just being human. Exactly. With God's heart. Exactly. With God's compassion. With God's grace. Amen. We become real. We become more human. Amen? Because in the end, it's Christ in us who is the hope of glory the hope of this world. So go and be human and let God be God. That's our, our challenge is to be human, not to be God. He has already declared us to be children of God. There's nothing you're going to do to make yourself more godly. It's only God that can do that. But how does it happen? I'm reading that it happens as we behold his glory. How did we behold his glory? Has anybody seen anything other than the person of Jesus? That's what we have here as a to behold. That's what they beheld. In fact, they swore up and down, we beheld his glory. That as of the only begotten. And they beheld it in a human being. And that is our challenge, the same challenge Jesus had. Although we are equal with God, we don't find it to be robbery to be equal with God. Yet we live our lives as human beings, not as God. The God that's in us will reveal himself through us if we will just be really us. The problem God has is trying to be revealed in somebody who's funny, in somebody who's trying to be something that he's not. We are human. 
We're supposed to be human. He made us human. If he didn't want us to be human, he'd have made us something else. He'd have, when we got born again, he'd have given us some other body, some other circumstance, some other manifestation. But no, because why? This is about incarnation. God wants to be incarnate, but he has to be incarnate in a human or else he's invisible. His glory is revealed through our humanity, not through our divinity. Am I making sense? The more real we are as humans, the greater impact we can have on humanity. That's why it's difficult as a pastor, except, you know, for a few people who know me as a pastor, most people don't unless I tell them because I don't go around with a bumper sticker and, you know, the whole thing, and I don't act like a quote-unquote pastor. I just act like me for whatever that's worth. And the dry cleaner tells me dirty jokes, and they all, you know, they, you know, because, but let me tell you this. I laugh at them. I don't mock it. I don't go, oh, my God, you know, how dare you? <laughs> you know. When the grandson's in the hospital dying, he asked me to pray. Would you and your church pray? It doesn't take away from who I am as a believer. He knows I'm a believer. He enjoys being just a human with me, but he knows he can also come to me and that I will pray. He doesn't, I, he doesn't see hypocrisy in that. He would see the, the hypocrisy in me coming in there, you know, and so divine and so righteous and so holy that he couldn't even approach me with the truth. That he couldn't even tell me about the little disagreements he has with his wife or the issues that go on in the family. Because I would be judging him. You see what I'm saying? We have a greater impact in people's lives. We have a greater reach into people's lives by being a human being that has God in them. Not judging them, not criticizing them, not correcting them, just simply looking at them, beholding them, loving them, and saying, what can I do? Not, you know, come down to the church and, you know, get baptized and repent and do all this and do that and do the other. Just let God bless you. Let God love you. Let God be God. All this through a human being. That's what Jesus did. You say, well, Jesus never sinned. Well, listen, neither have you since you've been born again. Not, as far, not, not according to the Bible. Your flesh still does stuff, but it's not sin. Not in the eyes of God. Now imagine people who are bound by some of the same things that we do. You know what I'm saying? Only they're bound. Because they're guilty, they're judged, they're criticized, they're condemned, they're frustrated. Suppose somebody like you or I just went up and put your arm around him and said, hey, God's not mad at you, you know that? Did you know that God is not angry with you? And if, if, if drinking something you don't want to do, God will help you not do it. But you don't need to beat yourself up because you're drinking. You don't understand what I'm saying? If, if, if your just, you know, messed up relationship is something you want to fix, God wants to help you fix it. He's not going to condemn you because you don't function well in relationships. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying instead of the, the, the way we think of incarnation is like we've been recreated, now we are, quote, unquote, this perfect, you know, specimen of God. No, we're, we're humans. What is going to leave this planet is perfect. But what's on this planet is imperfect because it's on this planet. It can't be here, amen, and not be imperfect. Why? Do you think that maybe it's because this planet is populated by imperfect people 
that needs somebody they can relate to. And that's why God came in the flesh. They can smell the sweat. They can see the dirt. They can see the anguish, the pain, the suffering, the, the heartache, the, the, the humanity. And know that even with all of that, there was a God there that loved them. And that wasn't judging this flawed, weak flesh. But was interested in that eternal being that was on the inside. And the only way he could reach him was by incarnating in a temporal body. He went away, sent back the Holy Ghost so that we could do the very same thing. And the less we think about our deity in terms of ex external manifestation, the faster we are changed from glory to glory. The more we're focusing on our external religious look, the greater failures we are. Because God cannot and will not work through it. You see it over and over and over. It's the guy that says, I'm a mess. I need you, Lord, that says, goes away justified. And what does he say about justified? You become a justifier. You get reconciled, you become a reconciler. He doesn't say you become perfect and then you go out and perfect everybody else. You go with all your flaws, all your humanity, in reality, and you love them right to God. The God who operated the very same way. If we really, I, I, I know, I mean, I know Jesus didn't sin. But half the things we're calling sin, God doesn't call sin. The church calls it sin. Religious people call it sin. God doesn't call it sin. The sin is unbelief. And why is there unbelief? Because they haven't got a picture of God that's real that's genuine, that they can relate to. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's incarnation. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of incarnation. The hope of God being revealed. Truly, God being revealed. Not religion being revealed. You know, not hyper critical spirits being revealed. But glory. The grace, the mercy, the goodness of God. Say amen or oh man. Praise the Lord. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, you incarnates. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's be real, man. I mean, let's be real. Praise God. That's what he's given us this life for. Let's, hey, try it. Give it a shot for crying out loud. What do you got to lose? Exactly. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Be safe going home. God bless you. See you back here Sunday. See you Friday if you can be here. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord.